this is Nicole. Sorry for the late start. I was just trying to get everything situated. So I just want to say hi and thank you for joining me. I'm going to make sure that the volume is up and that we are all ready to go. Well, just like it always is with these Facebook live chats. I'm gonna wait to see if people join us. Hey, Rochelle, how are you doing? Thanks for joining me tonight. This is a really important topic. I never thought I would be coming on here to talk about something like this, but it needs to be discussed and I figured, why not? You know, let's see what people have to say about it and see if we can help parents and students and hopefully, we can do that tonight. It should be a great discussion. So as I always say, when you guys join me, if you could please hit the share button and share this out so more people can join us. And while I'm waiting for people to join us, let me uh, share it out as well, because maybe that will help. I'm not sure, but I'm going to try. Let me see if I can share it. Hold on one second. And let me just share it out. All right, while I'm sharing it, hopefully more people will will join us. They They said that they were interested, so I don't know where people are, but we will, we'll see. Now I know that, hey Trevor, you made it. I'm glad that you made it. I was just saying to Rochelle that, and thank you for sharing, Rochelle, that I never thought I would come on here to talk about something like this, but I started thinking because, you know, you guys have a disability, I have a disability. We know a lot of people with disabilities, with special needs. And I, I just wonder what happens to them in a situation where there's an active shooter at their school. And I mean an active shooter. Now I know they have droves and things like that. And I'm also wondering about those droves too because are they as specific as they can be for students who may need extra help? And if they're not, you know, the parents, the parent, there are things that the parents can do to find out what kind of help their students get and if they need more help they can they can request it and they can have meetings about this. Hi Kayla, thanks for joining us and if there's anyone else who wants to say hi in the comments please do and I will say hello to, be, hello to you. And some of you might not know this but I am a resident of Broward County. I am a native of Broward County. I've lived here most of my life. Uh, before I started my work doing advocacy work, I volunteered in Broward County Schools for five years. I was in a kindergarten class and a first grade class for one year. It was the same teacher, my friend. She is a wonderful teacher. And I'll never forget, it was probably, I think during the first year that I started volunteering, one day we had a drill and the kids were scared and they said that they were scared and part of the reason they were scared is because the lights were turned off and i didn't i didn't know why the lights were turned off because i don't have any kids i'm not in schools i don't know anything about girls so i asked my friend and i believe what she told me was it's because if there was an active shooter then the person would think that there was no one in the classroom but that's why they have to turn on turn off the lights. Now, keep in mind, these were five-year-olds that I was comforting during a practice drill. So can you imagine if it was a real drill? I mean, I, I just can't even imagine. And uh, so, you know, I've been literally crying every day for the last week. It's just, it's sad all the way around. But I do think that no one is talking about how are we protecting the students who may need extra help. 
I mean, I know for myself, if I was in a school similar to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, that school is huge. They have like 3,300 students and they have, it has a lot of stairs. I can't just run up and down stairs. That's just not going to happen. You know, so there's just a lot of things that go through my mind. And another thing is, you guys may have noticed on the page today, I shared out resources and articles and tips for parents and how they can talk to their kids and things that they can do. But what I was really surprised at is I couldn't really find anything specific to students with disabilities, except that one article that I shared. And I did print out the information because, you know, we're going to be going over some of it. But, you know, if you just do a Google search, you'll see that Yes, there is information about school shootings and, you know, what schools do and drills and all that. But there really isn't specific information on how they keep students with disabilities or students with special needs safe. And we actually have a teacher here. Jody is joining us. She's recently retired and she'll correct me, but I think she was a teacher for like 40 something years. I think she taught kindergarten. So I'm sure she knows a lot about this topic, you know, and because here on this page, you guys know that I've made a commitment to come here and talk to you every Thursday and do a Facebook live. And I like to have, you know, topics that are not only interesting and educational, but I want to help you guys if I can. And I just started thinking about it. I thought, well, it's obviously a timely topic. And it's relevant because there are a lot of kids who go to school who may have any type of disability. And I just sat here and I was wondering what happens to them. And, you know, obviously it has to be, it's, it's even more difficult when you're doing that type of a drill, whether it's real or not. But then when it's real, it's a whole different story because teachers today, they have too many students in their class, number one, at least here in Florida from what I've seen generally. I'm not talking about special education classes where the ratio uh, is higher for, for teachers to students, but you know, I just can't even imagine. Teachers don't get paid enough. There's, we can talk a lot about that, but we all know they don't get paid enough. And now they have to deal with the potential of somebody coming in with a weapon to kill them and their students. So I wanted to talk to you guys about some of the things that I looked up and the one that talked about how to, how to keep students with disabilities safe was an article from March 6, 2017 via friendshipcircle.org and it was by Dr. Dusty Columbia Embury and Dr. Laura Clark. And I noticed that they said in part that when we think about skills needed to handle a drill or an actual crisis, children have to be able to maintain silence, follow directions very quickly, maintain a position or a location, manage feelings of stress, frustration without acting out, and manage changes to schedule. But they also say that these are just a few of the skills required, but any one of these can be extremely pro problematic, if not impossible, for our children unless they are taught the necessary skills and provided with their required accommodations, which may include sensory supports, medical supports, and behavioral supports. So, you know, they talked about that, and they also talked about what are the best ways for parents to address these problems? Now, I am going to be looking through the comments and I'm going to be seeing what you guys have to say. So let me know if your child has an IEP, an Individualized Education Plan, because these two women say that for parents to address these problems, they have to start with the teacher and the IEP team. And there has to be an administrator on the IEP P team and that initial discussion can happen with all of the professionals who have direct contact contact and influence over the child and the policy and that 
these women are recommending having an individual emergency and lockdown plan, which is an IELP, in place for the student. So this way, we address teaching and progress on learning the required skills for surviving a lockdown or emergency at school as an integral part of the student's learning experience. Going over our teacher's emergency plan procedural checklist with the IEP team allows all of the stakeholders to be on the same page, so to speak. So now that we've learned a little bit about individual education plans and what parents can do, what's going on with you guys? Do you have currently have IEP plans for your child? And do you know the procedure when there's an emergency? And God forbid, in Florida, I think it's called a code red when there's an active shooter. So let me just see if I missed anybody in the comments here while you guys might want to type some answers to that question. I want to say hi to Maria. Thanks for joining us. And Maria says she's been thinking about that too, about students with disabilities. Yeah, you know, I mean, we're in a day and age where we have to think about these things. And just for those of you who may be joining us and weren't here in the beginning, I am a native of Broward County. I've lived here most of my life. I have cerebral palsy. I have volunteered in Broward County schools. At one point before my surgery, I was in an elementary school for five years consecutively at the same school in a kindergarten class, and then I was in a first grade class. So I have a lot of experience being around children, and you see a lot. and. The schools, they just, they don't have the resources to take care of everything. I mean, teachers here, they don't even have budget to buy the materials they need. So there's a lot going on. You know, we, we really need to support teachers a lot more than we do. But now there's this added issue of somebody potentially coming in and killing students and faculty. Rochelle says that she saw on Facebook that they have bulletproof backpacks on sale. Wow. Did you ever think that we would be talking about bulletproof backpacks? It's just, I, I, I don't even know what to say. You know, what's, what's going on in this country? Things definitely have to change. And we could be a part of that change. But we also have to be our own advocates and parents have to be advocates for their children, which I know you already are. But I just wanted to see how many parents do we have on here? Is there anyone on here now who's currently a parent of a child with a special need or with a disability? I'm just wondering. Because I also noticed that there was a sample individual emergency and lockdown plan for a, a student with autism and epilepsy. So this was the closest thing that I could find to something that was relatable to a student with a disability. And, you know, it talks about the student's strengths and her medical needs and then at the bottom, it talks about what her emergency kit should include. And this student who has a diagnosis of autism and epilepsy, they're saying that her emergency kit should include, and I don't know what some of these things are, but obviously an iPad, I know what that is. I'm speaking to you on one. Jewelry, box of markers, eight packs of Smarties, and her kit is in the back pack purse that she carries with her whenever she travels in the building. So, you know, that's just one example, but I really wish that there was more information out there that was specific to students with disabilities because, and I, I didn't look up this information, but there's, we make up a large part of the population just as a whole as people with disabilities. So, there have to be a lot of students who who have disabilities and I, I i don't see any of that being addressed now of course 
It's not that I expected to see it right now, but I would think that when schools take a look at their procedures and what they do during these lockdowns and these drills, I would hope that they would also take a look at are they are they doing everything they can for the students with disabilities because maybe they could do more i don't i don't know but i think parents you have to find out what's going on in your schools and you have to have meetings and you have to discuss this because that's the only way you're going to know what's going on because unfortunately you can't be with your child 24 hours a day and you want to send them to school because that's where they're supposed to go and I can understand if you didn't want them to go and if they were feeling scared and they didn't want to go. Kayla says she also always has a para that helps her. Yeah, many many students do and that's great but I, I as a parent would want to know what is the procedure for that para? What you know, some things have to change during lockdown, I, I would think. You know what I mean? It, 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 do, do those students, do they have priority? I mean, I, I don't know because, like I said, I don't have kids. I'm not in the school system, but it just, I just started thinking how different it must be for kids with disabilities because it's not the same. You know, if you're dealing with a student who can move on as his or her own and take care of himself and then you're dealing with a student like Kayla who has a pair or who has someone who can help her who helps her that's different so you know um I just thought it was an interesting topic an, an unfortunate topic and Rochelle says that everyone is so divided on gun control and politics concerning this Definitely. I mean, I watched the town hall that took place not too far from where I live, and I, I have to say the students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas are amazing. I have never seen anything like it, and I've been around a lot of kids. Granted, not really at the high school level, but still, they are just extraordinary students, and I am beyond disappointed with my senator, who I... I do not support at all. I, I am not a Marco Rubio supporter, but I really felt like he would improve his position or, or do something. I mean, what doesn't make sense is a lot of these senators, they're parents, but yet nobody does anything. So I'm hoping that the students, not just from Broward County, but from different areas of the country that are now protesting, that things will change. And... You know, it could be that they also have to change how they protect students with disabilities. That's why, you know, we're just talking about it today because somebody on my page, I don't think she's here right now, but she said that she has a child, I think her child has cerebral palsy, and that's one of her fears. She worries about that. You know, like what would happen if there was a shooting situation? So for the students who are listening, are you guys scared? Have you ever had to go through a lockdown that was real, like there was some kind of threat at your school? Uh, I'm assuming that you've been through ones that were uh, scheduled, scheduled drills. And, you know, how did those go? And, you know, just let, let us know what your experience has been. Hey, Freddie. Freddie says he doesn't have any children. However, when we would have fire drills, you would have to move at a fast pace to evacuate the building, and he would become very spastic and tense, and he would have trouble driving his power wheelchair. And thank goodness it was only a drill. And he says, by the way, good evening to everyone. But yeah, Freddie brings up a great point. You know, it, uh, I, I honestly don't remember... Maybe Rochelle could. Rochelle and I are around the same age, and she also grew up in in Broward County. But Rochelle, we didn't have any drills, did we? I mean, that was like before our time, wasn't it? I don't remember. I don't remember having any drills. For me personally, I mean, you know, when I was volunteering 
if I happened to be there on a day when there was a drill, which it was rare. I mean, I think, you know, we might have had a fire drill once in a while, and that other drill that I spoke about in the beginning that was, I think, to simulate an active shooter on, on the premises. Uh, but, hey, Samantha, I think you were, you were who I just referred to, weren't you? Or maybe, I think it was you or someone else who said you were scared because, yeah, your son uh, is a special needs student and he's in a wheelchair and he's not school age yet, but she's afraid to put him in public school because she says, where would you hide if you're in a wheelchair because there's nowhere for you to go? Yeah, Rochelle says, we didn't have drills, so... And my friend Liz is watching. She has oh, Liz three, right? I, three small children. So she, she might chime in if she wants to. And Hope is joining us. Hi, Hope. Hope says she's trying very hard not to freak out and just keep her daughter home because it terrifies her. And that's another thing I was thinking. I'm wondering if there's going to be a rise in parents who choose to homeschool their kids. Just across the board, whether or not they have a child with special needs or not. I mean, I can really understand where parents are saying, hey, you know, unless the government does something or, or figures part of this out, we're just not sending our kids to school. And, you know, that's another way that people can can advocate. I mean, I'm not I'm not telling people to do this, but can you imagine if a large majority of the population stood up and said, hey, we're not sending our kids to school. If, if you know, if my kid's school isn't protected or, you know, have certain things that they, they're just not sending them to school. And I can't say I would blame them. I mean, I don't, I'm not a proponent of not sending your kids to school. I'm, I'm a proponent of education, obviously, if I volunteered in the schools for as long as I have. And you know, I'm very pro-education, but I can understand parents' fears. And Liz says, yes, yeah, she has three kids. Cole is in kindergarten, and the twins aren't in school yet. <laughs> Hope likes the idea. I'm not sure if she likes the homeschooling or or advocating and saying, hey, we're not going to send our kids to school if the school is not protected. I think it might be the latter one. Uh, Rochelle says she feels that fear should not control us and people are afraid but we can't allow this to happen well i don't think fear should control us michelle but if you you know kids are getting murdered and if you know the government's not going to do anything about it, it then we need more more protests in my opinion you know we need the people who elect these officials to represent us and they don't do their job they either need we need to vote them out or we have to insist that they take us seriously because they don't you know a lot of americans you know we have it we have a great in this country you know and i think we 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 just don't protest like other countries do you know when we want our voice to be heard so i think that that might change things this time with the students because I don't see these kids backing down on it. And that's that's really what's been giving me hope. Um, it's unfortunate that teenagers have to be the ones calling these politicians out. Because this is what these people are supposed to be doing in Washington. They're supposed to be figuring out the laws and how to, how to bring bills, you know, into Congress and get things passed or and all that, you know. It, really shouldn't be on the backs of these shooting survivors. It's just awful. But, you know, like I said, if if we as, you know, those of you who are parents, if you're prepared, and also some of the information that you may have seen on my site, like they also give tips on, you know, how to talk to your child. And um, part of this information says, Parents can certainly have a safety plan at home and make sure students are aware of it and practice it in the ways that meet the individual student's needs. And the one woman said at her house, they have a copy of the emergency routes out of the house with their designated meetup location. 
posted on the inside of the kitchen cabinet with drinking glasses in it so the kids see it every time they get a glass and they've gone over it with their kids and they've talked about where to go if there's a fire drill and the other woman said she agrees that practice at home is crucial and is the op as is the opportunity for students to share what they have learned working with the school psychologist counselor or speech pathologist is often helpful to bridge the school to home gap and ensure that parents have a full understanding of the school emergency or IELP plan and she gives an example of in her school the speech pathologist does a great job creating a social story for students who require communication and behavioral behavior supports the social story includes pictures of appropriate school personnel and locations and walks students through the expectations of any school crisis tools like this can be great supports for our students and families so do you guys feel like you have enough information about your students school and what they do during you know these types of drills or like i said god forbid a real a real incident that the school has to deal with let me let me see if i'm missing any of the comments here and We'll see what everyone else is saying. So let me know what you guys are thinking so far. And, and, you know, why do you think this isn't being discussed? And just in general, like, I, I've never really heard anything, like, on the news, you know, about how to, how to protect a specific segment of students. And that's what we're talking about tonight because we all know cerebral palsy is the most common disability in childhood yet it's the one that's talked about the least and this topic kind of goes to that because I'm talking about st students with any type of disability but it's really not talked about I mean unless you're a parent and you you know about the IEP plan and you know what that entails and you know you you're going to be the ones going to these meetings but you know for the rest of us I, I never hear about anything like this. I just thought about it on my own because I know so many of my friends on Facebook, you know, they're a lot younger than me and they're in school or some of my friends like Liz, they might have <clears throat> kids of school age and not and her, she has cerebral palsy herself, but you know, um, it's still, I'm sure, an issue for her, whether or not her kids have disabilities or not. You know, it affects all parents. And, you know, when I was volunteering in an elementary school, I was volunteering in one that was considered in a low-income area. And, you know, a lot of these kids didn't have the support at home. So that's another thing. If they don't have the support at home... Now, maybe their parents aren't even attending these meetings or requesting the meetings. So there's a lot of things to, uh, that can be problematic. Hope says that she's told her daughter's teacher to get her out any way possible. She'll take a couple bruises on her over her losing her life in an emergency. Right, but do you know what their protocol is? Have you had the discussion with the administrators on what the protocol is. Yeah, they are speaking general school age students because, you know, I, I understand that's what they're gonna gear all the information toward. Liz says she knows about the school safety protocol for the school, but she doesn't know anything specific to children with special needs. Yeah, I don't know either, but in the, some, another, another, article that I read said that since Columbine, 32 states have passed laws requiring schools to conduct lockdown drills to keep students safe from intruders. And after Newtown in 2012, six states require specific active shooter drills each year. And then I also shared another article that talked about apps that schools are using. And there's one called Say Something which I believe was created by 
a parent of a child whose life was lost in Newtown. It, there's it, the Newtown is is related to this in some way. But Say Something is a 24-7 app, website, and phone line that enables any student, teacher, or parent to submit any tip or threat that they have heard. The program also teaches students and educators how to look for warning signs, especially on social media, of what may indicate someone could potentially be a threat to themselves or others. Now, that sounds like a great idea, this Say Something app. So that's something that you may want to look into and possibly share it with your children. I, I think it's great, you know, uh, especially since most of the younger generation, they're on social media anyway. And But I like that it allows either the students, teachers, or the parents to, you know, what does it say you can... Yeah, you can submit a tip or a threat. And I think that's that's what we have to do. You know, just like they were saying on the news, say something, isn't it? Say something, do something. If you're in school and you notice the behavior of someone in your school, say something and do something and tell someone about that student's behavior because you might just save your life or somebody else's life. That's really the honest truth of it. And Liz said she agrees and she's going to check that out. Yeah, let us know. You know, I mean, because it is a scary time, but there are things we can do to make ourselves feel better and to make our children and our students feel better. So, you know, I'm just hoping that the information that I shared today is helping you guys because... I think knowledge is power. You know, the more you know, the more you can do with the knowledge that you have. So let me check and see if anyone's saying anything. Uh, Liz says she's from New York. So the motto here since 9-11 is see something, say something. Oh, I think I had it wrong, right? Thank you. I think it is see something, say something. And they reiterate that at home often. Yeah. Yeah, that's important. Because the more kids hear about something and it becomes, you know, routine that they know, okay, if this happens, this is what we do. And you could go over it with them and you could have them tell you, you kind of quiz them. Okay, so I'll just give an example. If you lose your keys and you can't get in, what do you do? You know, or something like that. And you can have a discussion with them. Let me see what anyone else is saying. So, do you guys have any comments so far? And have you heard anything else that that you think would be helpful to anyone else here in terms of, I don't know, just lessening their child's anxiety? You know, I think that's going to be a big problem too. Uh, Rochelle says she's she's going to try to find the article she saw where they said a lot of special needs kids were told to be put in closets. Yeah, um, well, I think that seems to be a popular place for the students to go. I know in, down here, many of the students were in a closet for four hours. Now, I don't know how that would work with certain special needs students if they would be, uh, you know, if, if there are students who get anxious and it would it would cause them to act out if they were in a closet again I don't you know I don't know how that would work and that would have to be specific to the student and in the school I guess if, if the school even does that you know it's just I don't know but it's something you know definitely to, to think about. And, you know, it's not just even kids with physical disabilities. It's like the example I have with a child, if they have autism or epilepsy or, I mean, you have a lot of kids who have, uh, they're nonverbal, so they can't, they can't verbalize how they're feeling. But, you know, I know if they, if they can show you how they're feeling, but some kids, they might not be able to do 
any of that. So they really rely on their para if if they have one or, you know, because I know myself from being in the classroom, there's there's not enough teachers in there. I mean, even if even if there's what the school that I was in before I got there, I was told that I think each kindergarten class had a teacher and an assistant, but then they didn't have that anymore. So, you know, even two people is better than one, but I can tell you, even with two people, it's a lot of work, you know, just to go through a normal day in a classroom. And I can't even imagine then having to stop everything you're doing and then go through this horrific experience. And then you're, at the same time, you're, you're trying to calm your students and reassure them that everything is okay when really nobody has any idea. And I really hope that the students who are protesting, I hope that their voice is going to be heard and it's going to turn into action because that's what we need. We need action. And for me, someone who was born in Broward County, you know, I've, I'm a product of Broward County Schools been crying for a week and I said well I don't really know what I can do to further this never again movement and I believe enough is enough so I'm supporting those causes but the only thing I could think to do is come to you know this page and talk to people who may be fearful about this and see how you all are doing and if there's anything I can do to help you and give you information because really at this point, that's all I can do. I mean, if it were up to me, I would have been in Washington yesterday with those kids, you know, talking to the senators and everything they did. But one thing struck me, even when they were talking to the president, nobody, none of these politicians had any expression on their face when these parents were telling them, my daughter got shot in the back and she died. My son died. You know, they, they, they just, they looked at them and they were listening, but... I mean, I was crying in my living room and I didn't have these people in front of me telling me that they just went through this. So that's something that kind of gets me, you know. I, I don't know what it is about politicians, but they just don't seem to be able to show emotions. I don't know if they go to school to learn how to do that or, or what, but I, I really wish they would have showed some more emotion because it's very sad. All right, let me check and see what you guys are saying. And... Let me know, did you find the information that I've been sharing today helpful? I've I shared several articles and, you know, I tried to find things that, you know, that I felt that might help you and, and I hope that they did, even if just for just, you know, in a small way. But I think the thing to take away from this discussion is that parents... You have to know what's going on in the schools. You have to, if you need to request a meeting, or request one. You know, if you feel like you don't really know what they do during these dr drills and you would like to know more about how your child is protected, especially if your child has special needs or has a disability, you have a right to to request a meeting and that's what I would tell you to do and for the rest of us you know like I said I don't have any children I just I know I've loved kids all my life and I love volunteering with them and I can't even imagine you know having been in the school going through something like that I mean I really thought after Newtown I thought something was going to be done immediately because when you start killing five-year-olds, six-year-olds, six year old, and I think some of them were 10, I really thought that our government would say, that's it, we put our foot down, enough is enough, you, you can't kill our, our babies, you can't do that. But nothing was done, so I just shook my head. And just here in South Florida alone, we had this, the shooting. We had the airport shooting, which was about a year ago. And then in between that, we had the nursing home tragedy where I think 14 people lost their lives because the 
the facility didn't call 911. Just a whole big debacle. But people are dying. And the thing is, no one's ever held accountable either, you know. So, that's what I don't understand. All right, I think somebody left me a comment. Let's see. Hi, Vicki. Hey, thanks for joining us. Vicki, do you have a student with special needs or with a disability? Just curious because we were talking about some of the things that parents can do, which is they can learn about their school's emergency plan. They can have a meeting with the staff and talk about how their, how their child will be protected if there's, let's say, an active drill, you know, not, you know, it's a good idea to know what they do when they, when they do these practice drills so you know. And, you know, for those of you who have students that you can speak to and they can understand, you know, maybe it would help to go over, over with them what happens, you know, during a drill and, you know, why they have the drills or, you know, whatever you think would help your child. You know your child better than anyone. But I do know that, you know, anxiety is a common, common issue for a lot of people. So you can imagine going through a drill, whether it's practice or not. I mean, if someone is prone to anxiety, it's going to, it's going to affect them either way. So, so what are you guys thinking? Anybody else want to, want to comment? Let me look in my notes here and see what else it also gave a teacher's emergency plan procedural checklist and it talks about develop a clear safety plan for lockdowns across the entire building consider obstacles such as stairs loud alarms that might be a physical sensory or emotional barrier to a student Develop a clear safety plan for different times of day. Include contingencies for busy traffic times, such as beginning and end of day and during lunch, and schedule changes for events such as school assembly. And it says, develop individually emergency and lockdown plan for each student. Also involve local emergency personnel, police, fire, and EMT in the plan annually to ensure that they are aware of specific needs of students with disabilities so that in the event of an emergency, they are familiar with those students requiring specialized procedures. And number five, which what I sort of just talked about, teach students what to do. This includes how, when, and where to go, and when they can come out, what words might be said, such as an all clear announcement or police officers identifying themselves. Practice the plan with the students in the classroom. Provide lots of opportunities for practice to mastery. Many students with disabilities need multiple opportunities to practice skills to gain and ma maintain mastery. Practice seeing the plan in every classroom in which the student might be. Because generalization is a challenge for many students, it is imperative that students practice across multiple settings. That's a good point. Practice the plan in the halls and community area of the school. For example, if the student is in the restroom or taking a note to the office, where should she or he go in the event of an emergency? Keep copies of the plan with lesson plans and roster as well as a set located in the office and possibly with the student. Keep an emergency bag for students that will help them maintain safety in the event of a lockdown. The bag can include favorite items, snacks, activities, or other things to keep students occupied and quiet. Suggestions include stuffed animals, stress balls, and headphones to lessen anxiety. Include needed med medical supplies, such as masks for those with respiratory difficulties, snack items and medication for students with dis diabetes, excuse me, and rescue medications for students with epilepsy and allergies. So this student checklist is included in that article on the page and you could print it out and maybe it's something you can take with you 
If you have an IEP plan and you want to learn more about the school's emergency plan and procedural checklist. You know, I think it's really good information. How are you guys doing? Anybody? Hey, Matt, you made it. Matt, I wanted to ask you. I'm glad you made it. Matt is an adult and he has cerebral palsy, but he goes into schools and he speaks to students. So I was interested in learning from Matt. Matt, how do you feel going into schools? Would you? What would you do if there was an emergency situation? And we'll give Matt some time to respond if he wants to. But I was thinking about that because I've gone into schools and I've given presentations. I've also, like I said, volunteered in the schools. But I... I was never briefed or trained in what the school's emergency plan was. So I think that volunteers should should be given that information. I mean, I'm trying to think if they put in a packet. I really don't think they did. I, I don't know if I remember seeing that. I could be wrong because it's been a long time now. But in any event, many schools have a lot of volunteers. So they should know what to do during an emergency situation. The, Vicky says that she doesn't have a student at risk. She's not a teacher anymore. Oh, so you were a teacher, Vicky? What grade did you teach? She says, but it's something she worries about. Yeah, it's, it's unfortunate that we even have to have this discussion, but I think that a lot of us are worrying about this, and I've kind of felt like, if I'm sitting here and I don't even have children and I don't, I, I don't have any reason to know what any school's emergency plan is, and I'm, I'm feeling for people who, who do, you know, I knew that you guys might be feeling the same way. Wow, Vicki said that she used to teach high school. She taught 11th and 12th grade. Well, I have to say God bless you because, you know, I... I know when I used to tell people that I volunteered with five-year-olds, they would either, most of the time they would say, no way, like, I don't know how you do that. There's no way I could do it. But I loved it. The kids loved me. It was a perfect match. And, and I keep saying I'm going to get back into it, but I just haven't, I don't know why, you know, I just haven't done it. And it has nothing to do with, with the topic tonight, I just just haven't. But you know, maybe it's, it's a possibility. I'll, always, I'm always welcome back at the school. They love me over there. You know, and my teacher friends, and I have I have people in my family who are educators. This could have been any of them, you know. And now there's talk of giving teacher teachers weapons. I'm sorry, no. Teachers don't get paid enough as it is and they don't even have money for supplies and they have to spend their own money and now you want to give them a weapon i don't i don't think so and president trump said 20 percent of the teachers would be trained but somebody brought up an excellent point that 20 percent is 700,000 teachers so no i don't i don't see that working how are you going to train 700,000 teachers. I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't think that would work. And I know for myself, if I were a teacher, I wouldn't want a weapon. No, sorry. Mm -mm. So guys, we're, we're getting uh, close to the end here. Is there anything else that you would want to add about this topic? You know, how you're feeling about it? Are you planning on talking to your children about it? Have your children asked you anything about it? You know, because it's it's been all over the news. You know, how are they feeling? And, you know, is there anything else, you know, you think that we can do to at least lessen the anxiety and start a discussion, you know, with your kids if they're able to have a discussion with you because, you know, I know it's a scary time, but there are things that we can do. And if we 
arm ourselves with information and not weapons because I don't think giving teachers weapons, I don't think that's the answer. I do think that schools should have armed guards and there should be more than one. Like, for example, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the campus has 3,300 students and they only had one armed guard who we found out today just before coming live to you that the armed guard never entered the building. So that guy retired because they put him on leave, but he knew his job was over, you know, done. So they put him on paid leave and he retired. So how, how nice is that? This, this guy, that was his job to go into the school if there was a situation with an active shooter. And there was, but he didn't go into the building. So, and now he's on paid leave. I, that's nice, isn't it? Hope says her daughter doesn't seem to be worried, which is good. She's pretty naive. Kind of worries me a bit. How old is your daughter, Hope? Because, you know, she may not be worried, but you can still take the opportunity to, to talk to her. Hey, Sandra, how are you? Sandra says, do parents call the police? Uh, do parents call the local fire department or police department and inform them about their special needs kids at the school? Um, Sandra, I don't, I don't know. I, I, the place for you to start is the school and to have an IEP, which you may already have. And, you know, that's a question you, you can ask the school. And Hope says her daughter is 15, and they're definitely talking about it. I think that's great, and if you need to, you can show her this video and, and the articles that I posted. You know, maybe some of that would help start a discussion, you know. Um, oh, boy, Vicky says her husband is a former Marine trained to kill. Well, Vicky, we need people like your husband, you know, because they were talking about on the news perhaps retired military personnel, they would, some of them would want to, you know, be the armed guards at, at schools. And those are the people that I would feel comfortable with having a weapon, obviously, because they're trained in what to do with them. But yeah, you know, we've, it's a big problem in this country. I think it's unfortunate you know, other countries seem to have a better handle on this by far than we do. Hope says her daughter's listening. Hi to Hope's daughter. And they're doing stretches. And she thought it might help bring up a discussion with her. Well, I hope I'm saying hi to your daughter. I hope you're enjoying this discussion. And Vicki, as a former teacher, she says that teachers shouldn't be expected to do that. To carry weapons and I agree I really do and I don't think there's any amount of money that you can pay teachers to get them to want to carry a gun although I heard just recently a special education teacher on the news she said no nope, I want a gun if I if I can help protect you know the students I you know I want to do it so god bless her because like I said I wouldn't do it hey Rosie how are you my friend Rosie Rosie, how many kids do you have? Two? And her son, wait, he's in college, right? But your daughter, is your daughter still in high school? Because if she is, I'm wondering, how, how do you feel about, well, even your son too. I mean, unfortunately, there have been, you know, shootings on, on college campuses. But I just wonder, wonder how the parents out there, how are you feeling? Because for, for somebody who, like I said, I don't have kids of my own. I, and I'm crying over this. I can't imagine how all of you are feeling. And this one, they've all affected me. But, you know, this one with in my own county and these kids and seeing what they're doing and, you know, going to Washington and meeting with the president. Although I will say that I read an article today that included a tweet from some of the kids from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, some of the ones you see all over the news, why weren't they at the meeting with the president? Well, we learned the reason. They weren't invited. 
If they weren't pro-Trump, they weren't invited. That's, I don't agree with that, but anyway. Hope says, if they were already comfortable and trained and owned their own gun, unfortunately it doesn't make her feel safer. And Freddie says, an active shooter can happen anywhere. Walmart, the movies, the mall, it's scary to go anywhere. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And, and now, at this point in my life, I hardly go anywhere. And it's not because of any kind of fear or anything like that. But I was just thinking to myself earlier, gee, I'm kind of glad I am I really don't want to go anywhere because he, he, Freddie's right. You just, you don't know when anything is going to happen, just like what we saw in Las Vegas. I mean, people are at a concert, so I, I don't have the answers. You know, I definitely have my own opinion on gun control, and I do think that we need gun control. No person who is not in the military or a police officer needs an AK is it an AK-15? You don't need that. So I don't understand why those can't be banned. People want to have weapons and they want to hunt and they want to protect themselves. I'm all for that. Why can't you do that with another type of weapon? And Brandon says he just thought about something. What about video cameras in the classroom that the front office uh, could see? Well, that's a good point, Brandon. I, I don't know, you know, I'm sure there are schools that have them already, but I did read something that Newtown had some kind of security system installed, and they spent thousands of dollars, but unfortunately the killer who, who went in there and killed those kids, he just bypassed that, I think the article said. So they spent all this money in he was able to just get by it. So, you know, and then I was reading about metal, metal detectors, excuse me, because I thought, you know, that would help. And I guess they might help, but I forgot exactly what the article said where, you know, usually they're put in schools. I think of like lower income areas or something like that. But if you go on the page, there is a school that is named the safest school in America You'll see what they're what they're doing, what what they installed. It's unbelievable. There's like they show a video, and then there's red lines where if the kids go, I think over the red lines, then if somebody comes in, the shooter they can't they can't get to them or something. You have to watch the video. It, it's truly amazing. I mean, I think we could start with mental health checks. If you have a history of mental illness. You know, you can't get access to a gun. Um, bulletproof, bulletproof doors and, and, I mean, windows. I, I really do think all schools should have those. I, I don't see why that can't happen. So these are some things to think about. And I hope you guys found this to be a useful discussion. You know, it's really sad that these parents will never see their kids again and their friends won't ever see their, their friends again. And I really hope that, you know, this is the last time. I mean, I'm not naive enough to think that nothing is going to happen again because we don't have anything in place right now, and I think that's going to take a long time. I don't see it happening very quickly in this country. So, And there's already been many, many threats since eight days ago. You know, there's called the copycat threats, and even in, even in the same county and other, other schools across the country, which I think is really sad. And another article I didn't get to read, but I want to, is that it, it talked about there's a problem with the young men in our society because every shooter is a male. So we've got to look into that. 
And I do, I do think that mental, mental health is a part of it. You know, there are people who are divided and they say, no, mental health doesn't have anything to do with it. I think it does. And I know in other countries, I've read that mental health doesn't play a part in it. But I think in our country it does. Because every time there's a shooting, it's every time we learn that that person had a history of mental illness. So, you know, I don't know the answer, but I know that for you parents out there, you can educate yourself as much as you can and talk to your students and talk to the school. And that would be, that would be a great start, you know? And then we could all just support each other uh, the best that we can. So, well, guys, if no one else has the last word, I'm probably going to sign off now. I hope that you guys found this to be an interesting discussion. Please go back through the page and look at the resources that I put on there for you. You know, they might help you. And I guess with that, I will see you next Thursday. I'll have to think of a topic and we'll see. But as it is right now, I want to thank you for joining me. The page keeps growing. I appreciate it. If you guys would do me a favor, those of you who have already shared this, thank you. Anyone else, please share this video. Please encourage people to watch it. And invite them to the page. Because I, I love coming on here live. And meeting all of you. And what I like the most is having a discussion. Hey Barbara, how are you? I'm glad you made it. I, I, I like hearing what you guys have to say. And I like how we all support each other. And someone something that someone says might help you. And vice versa. And that's what it's all about here on what CP looks like. I like to help as many people as I can while at the same time changing the perception of what CP looks like. And if you want more information about me and what I do, please go to my website, NicoleLuongo.com. And I'm having a big virtual party on March 29th. That is my fifth anniversary uh, of having selective dorsal rhizotomy surgery. So I hope you'll all join me because you guys are the people that I have to celebrate with. I don't really have anybody to celebrate with here. So I thought I would bring in all the people who've been following my journey and invite you. And I'm going to have some special guests on the broadcast. Liz, who was here earlier, she's going to be on there with me. And I'm going to meet her mom for the first time on camera. I've never met them in person Hope, we hope to meet someday. But Liz had the surgery because of my article for HuffPost. And I'm going to talk to her and see how she's doing. And my friend Ashley, she has a similar story. I'm going to talk to her too. So we're just going to have a lot of fun. And I hope you all can join me. I did create an event which is on the page. So please go there. And if you're going to join us, please indicate that. So I know how many people are going to come to the party. And if you could share that out too, I would really appreciate it. Freddie says, in the Houston area, young girls put on Snapchat that they would shoot up their school, but they got turned in before anything happened. Wow. Yeah. Yep. We had a couple of instances in this county where, <clears throat> I think there were two girls actually, uh, two separate instances, but they were in court because of similar threats. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't understand. I don't understand why that would be the first thing you think of if whatever you're going through. You know, I, for me, it would never occur to me that I would want to go kill anyone, let alone, let alone people at my school. I just, I, I don't know what goes through the minds of people. I really don't, but I think part of it is with some of these shooters, because I think they have said that, oh, you know, they want to kill more people than the last, the last shooter. So I think part of it is a sick way of that they're going to get notoriety or something. That was just something I thought of. 
there's a lot of a lot of speculation and a lot of things that I think are involved. You know, it has to be a multi-pronged approach. It really has to be the school. It has to be the parents. It has to be law enforcement. You know, we have to give kids the help that they need. And unfortunately, the shooter, Nicholas Cruz, he fell through the cracks. The school board, I mean the school board, the, the, he was reported, there were tips given about him. The FBI admitted that they didn't, they didn't get one of those tips. That was the one from last month. And then a, one from three years ago, they didn't do anything about that one. So, there's been fumbles all the way around. And I don't, I don't think we can allow those to happen because then that's how people lose their lives you know so guys with that having been said i'm gonna say thank you for joining me this is nicole with what cp looks like we have been talking about how to keep kids with disabilities safe at school and i hope you share this video i hope you enjoyed it and have a great night and i will see you guys next time bye